he was like, let's be Bonnie and Clyde. Hmm. You said that? Yeah. I was like, okay. And you know, I could hear my grandpa just yelling, you know, them fighting. And then I started getting the rush. I started just, just beating her head with it. It was, it was kind of creepy because she was like scared uh -huh. to die. Like, how did you finally get control of your grandmother? Because in the past, she's been able, she's eventually been able to handle you, right? She's been able to get the upper hand. What was different this time? I've always been in control. By April 2017, the police in Gwinnett County, Georgia, were well acquainted with 17-year-old Cassandra Bjorge and her criminal history. But when she found the self-proclaimed Clyde to her Bonnie and Johnny Ryder, Cassie's deviance rose to a whole new level. What began with an attack would lead the police to discover something far more heinous, including horrifically the couple living in a house with dead bodies nearby. But even this was only the beginning of their shocking depths of depravity. The majority of the following footage has never been seen before. It has been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed clinical psychologist, a licensed professional counselor and a former detective, former licensed polygraph examiner, and former hostage negotiation commander and instructor. Chaos kicked off on April 8, 2017, shortly after 8.30 p.m. when police received a call from Tomoko Ryder, Johnny's mom, who had just walked in on an assault in progress in her home. Though none of the responding officers could have possibly known, they were now investigating a bizarre string of violence and a case that would come to encompass so much more than assault. Mindy Ryder, Johnny's sister, provided this summary of the attack, starting when she and her boyfriend, Kevin, returned home to eat dinner. I'm not sure what time it was, but we were about to eat the food we just to go, and I noticed my room is trashed, like everything's been flipped out, like all my purses have been went through, and I told my brother, I know you did this. You guys, you and your girlfriend are the only ones that have been home. Like, just own up to it. Like, just own up to it and tell me. I won't call the cops or anything. And at the time, he was on the phone with my mom, and he was like, so if you don't, if I own up to it, you won't call the cops. And I said, yes. So that's when he hung up, and I hung up on the police. Like, I already dialed 911. And then all of a sudden, he goes out and comes back in and just sprays us straight in our faces and starts hitting us and tells his girlfriend to go grab the bat. 19-year-old Johnny and his girlfriend, 17-year-old Cassie Bjorge, then sprayed Mindy and Kevin in the face with bear repellent, which is stronger than typical pepper spray. The attack only escalated from there. And I see her come in with a bat, and the first thing she does is hit me across my back. And I try to grab it from her, and she hits me on the head and kicks kicking me in the stomach. And Kevin and Johnny are fighting in my room. So I chase her out to the living room, and I'm trying to grab the bat. And I hear Kevin begging my brother, like, Johnny, please don't do this. You don't have to do this. And I went in the room, and Johnny had Kevin in a chokehold. And uh, my brother's girlfriend was in there with the bat. And so I was able to, like, grab her by her hair and, like, take the bat away from her. And I started hitting my brother, telling him to let go. And then I handed the bat to Kevin. And then Kevin was going to hit my brother, but my brother caught the bat. And then we all fought over the bat. And it was me and my brother on my sofa. And then Kevin grabbed a beer bottle and told Johnny to stop, to just let us go. And, like, we won't do anything. But my brother said he, he will never do that. And so Kevin hit him on the top of the head with the beer bottle. And it shattered. So Johnny had a bat, we hold it, and then Johnny was like, bring a hammer, because he couldn't take it by himself, obviously. And you got hit with the bat, too? Yes, sir. But I first, I kind of blocked it here, really. It was, I just blocked it, mm -hmm. so it was okay. But second time, I got hit. I got hit my teeth, too. He kicked me in the face, so my teeth fell down. The escalation from attacking with a bat to a hammer was stopped when Johnny and Mindy's mother returned home from work. With the odds no longer in their favor, the two assailants, Johnny and Cassie, fled. However, this would eventually prove to be their downfall. In addition to his damaged tooth, Kevin had injuries to his hands, arms, and ear, not to mention the burning of the bear mace. As for Mindy, it took seven staples to close a wound on her scalp, and she also had welts on her back from the bat. The assault wasn't the only crime committed at the Ryder house that night, in fact, it was only the beginning. 
Johnny and his girlfriend stole Mindy's car to make their escape. The attackers had also abandoned the vehicle they arrived in. When police ran the plate on that car, they made a shocking discovery. It belonged to a 63-year-old man by the name of Randall Bjorge. The car wasn't the only tie to Randall, though. Randall's granddaughter was Cassie. The first hint that something was wrong actually came over a week prior on March 28, 2017, when Cassie's grandmother, 63-year-old Wendy Bjorge, reported Cassie missing. Wendy and Randall had custody of Cassie for over a year by this point. They'd hoped to help her through some behavioral issues she'd been having, including using drugs and running away. Based on her recent disappearance, though, it seemed that at least one of those issues persisted. When there was still no word from Cassie after a few days, Wendy made this Facebook post asking friends to keep an eye out for her granddaughter. After that, it was radio silence from the Bjorge family. It looked like Wendy and Randall had gone off the grid just like their granddaughter. Concerned, Wendy's sister, who lived in California, asked the Gwinnett County Police to do a welfare check on April 6th, two days before the attack at the Ryder House. She had become concerned when she received some text from Wendy's number that didn't quite sound like her and made her suspect that they'd actually been sent by someone else. Police attempted the welfare check, but left when no one answered the door. Even if police had forced entry, it still would have been far too late to avert tragedy. After what happened at the Ryder House, though, police knew they needed to talk to at least one of the Bjorges. They returned to Wendy and Randall's house looking for answers. This time, when no one answered their knocks, they forced their way in. Nothing could have prepared them for what they were about to find. As they walked into the house, they discovered a mess downstairs, with drugs and paraphernalia scattered about the living room and food left out to rot in the kitchen. It also appeared as though most of the house had been ransacked. The real horrors, however, were found upstairs, hidden behind the sealed doors to the bathroom and master bedroom. But the truth of what was behind those doors wouldn't be revealed until a shocking interrogation. What police found inside added a whole new sense of urgency to the hunt for Johnny and Cassie. Despite an in-depth search of the residence, Wendy's cell phone was nowhere to be found. The investigators pinged the device and traced it to an apartment building in the nearby town of Sewanee. When police arrived at the location, they had their first stroke of luck in this horrifying and chaotic case. In the parking lot out front was the car stolen from the Ryder house. As it turned out, Johnny and Cassie had sought out sanctuary with an old friend named Jake, perhaps hoping to hide from the manhunt that was looking for them. Iwu obtained an exclusive never-before-heard interview with Jake, who spoke about Johnny and the events of the fateful night which led to police arriving at his home the next morning. I met him in middle school. So sixth grade, we were 12 or 13 years old. He was always the class clown and everything. Very funny, very loud, very outspoken, but also very kind and very polite. I mean, eventually he practically became family. He was at my house every weekend growing up in middle school and early high school. By mid-high school, however, Jake and Johnny drifted apart as Johnny became more involved with drugs and alcohol. They'd only recently gotten back in touch to have lunch a couple times, but Jake never could have expected what the relationship would bring next. It was about 10 p.m. and I was at work and I got the call from my mom that he was at the door. And so when I heard that he was there and that he was crying, I left work immediately and went straight home. According to Jake, Johnny was accompanied by his girlfriend, who introduced herself as Cassandra. Jake had seen her once in high school, but didn't know her any more than that. That night, he said she was quiet and polite and didn't give him any indication to suspect a more sinister reason for her presence. They couldn't have known the shocking secrets they were hiding. That's when things started to take a weird turn. He said that he had gotten into a fight with his mom, which you know, at the time didn't seem strange because he has, you know, has fought with his mom plenty of times before. And there's been times where he's been at my house because of it. 
and that she got so angry that she pepper sprayed him and he ran to the first place he thought of, which was me. Confused and concerned, Jake and his mom let Johnny and his girlfriend spend the night and work the rest out in the morning. But they had no idea what crises the morning would bring or what else Cassie and Johnny had already done. Just when we thought it was just in basically a family member old family member coming in a time for help was really, you know, one of the most traumatizing days I've ever had. Despite the horrors to come, the day actually started like any other. I woke up the next morning and he was, you know, talking to my family like how he always did when we were kids, you know, treating them like a parent, treating me like a brother, he was drinking coffee outside, catching up. And when I went to take my dog out, that's when I started to realize that things were turning for the worst. Um, at the time, you know, our, our building faced out towards the parking lot. And um, every day I see the same cars. But that day there was a blacked out Suburban right in front of our house, which I thought was really strange. And go back in, have a cup of coffee. And next thing I hear... Um, from my room was a like a blow horn basically calling out my apartment number and Johnny's name to come outside and it took me a second because you're not <laughs> expecting to hear that at 10 a.m on a Sunday morning until finally the second time it happened I got up and I started walking down my hallway and next thing I know there's red dot sights on the walls on my body Jake said that instinct took over, and he collected his sister and his mother, who had recently started to use a wheelchair, and prepared to exit the apartment. Unfortunately for the family, the horror was just beginning. As we're about to go out the door, I see Johnny grab a knife, and I was like, what the hell are you doing? And he was like, what I thought could have been coming to stab me was him coming to give me a hug and say, he's so sorry. And he's sorry for doing this, sorry for everything. He told me that he loved me, and he wishes he didn't bring this on us and my family. And I just kind of froze, and he dropped the knife, gave my sister a hug, said the same thing, and um, then we went outside to every freaking cop in the county there a few SWAT vans, and an ambulance. Johnny and Cassie were still inside. Initially, the SWAT team and other investigators resolved to wait them out until they were contacted by Johnny's mother, who had received a concerning voicemail from her son. Hey, Ma, it's Johnny. I'm crazy. I'm evil. I'm sorry. I'm in the inside. I'm not well. I'm dying as we speak. I love you. I'll see you later, okay? I love you. Bye. Police no longer had the luxury of time to wake Johnny and Cassie out. However, they also knew that the pair could be dangerous, which meant that rushing inside could be foolish. With this in mind, police decided to make an entry using a video and audio equipped robot. Robots are often used in situations where officer safety is a major concern. Obviously, it's preferable to sacrifice tech instead of human life. Depending on the needs of the situation, the robot can make deliveries or even use weapons or flashbangs. It also has video capabilities that allow law enforcement to get a good look inside a hideout all from a safe distance away. Even better, all footage and audio recorded by the robot is admissible in court. Right away, the robot revealed a concerning stain on the carpet outside the bathroom. Johnny, Cassie, say something so we can see that you're okay. Neither Johnny nor Cassie responded, and when the robot forced its way past the bathroom door, it became clear as to why. (laughs) 
Realizing that Cassie and Johnny were in danger, the SWAT team took over and rushed inside to provide medical assistance. Unfortunately, the resulting damage to the apartment left Jake's family in a very difficult financial situation, and they ultimately had to find a different place to live. Johnny and Cassie were rushed to the hospital to receive emergency treatment. For the time being, it was unclear if these injuries were self-inflicted or if the couple had turned on each other once they realized they were caught. There would be no answers to those questions or any others if Cassie and Johnny didn't survive. Thankfully for investigators, after a few days, doctors at the hospital determined that Johnny was stable enough for an interview. So, I mean, we do like to kind of find out, you know, what happened and and kind of get your side of the story of what's been going on the past few days, you know, and... He's been at the hospital. Mm-hmm. Would you like to talk about... Your, is that your girlfriend, Cassie, or is it just a friend or what? She's okay. Yeah, she's fine. No, she's fine. No one's told you anything or... Yeah, she's fine. How long have you guys been dating? A lifetime. You can't live without Cassie. Like, I don't know why. I never felt like this about any other girl. This is a bold statement from 19-year-old Johnny, considering he'd previously been married and only finalized his divorce about two weeks prior. I was, I heard her scream. Yeah. I think she was more upset because people were trying to help her and... From what I was told, she's kind of, she's a fighter and she's kind of a pistol, hard to deal with sometimes. Okay, that being said, obviously we want to talk to you about some specific stuff. You're kind of not free to go. You're here at the hospital. So free to go? You're not free to go. You're here at the hospital. So in order for me to ask you some specific questions, I got to read you your rights. Johnny had likely been through this before, as he'd just finished serving jail time for entering automobiles and obstructing an officer. Are you okay talking with us right now without an attorney? I would just, I mean, I don't really feel comfortable. Well, I don't feel comfortable here at the hospital either, so. Yeah, but I don't feel yeah. comfortable talking about it. Maybe I want to talk to like a court appointed attorney and then just like talk to them because I don't feel right. Um, well, I'm, I'm just, well, this may be our last shot on talking to you because we got other, I decided to talk to you first. Because uh, I already know kind of what's been going on. I know Cassie's background. I know things that have been said. I, I know what's going on with her family. I already spoke to your family. I kind of know what's going on with your family. Obviously, you being a man, I'm being a man. We're all men here. I want to come first to you, man up, and let's talk about what the heck happened. I don't know. I, I have ADD. Like, I'm a really deep thinker, but like, I would really like to talk to a counselor or psychiatrist to see what the hell is wrong with me. Without Johnny's consent, police had no choice but to wrap things up and take their questions elsewhere. Luckily for them, there was another potential source of information just down the hall. With no answers from Johnny, police were likely very aware that a conversation with Cassie was their last chance to get a first-hand explanation for the brutal disaster scene at the Bjorg house and the chaos that followed. With that in mind, they sent in an officer that Cassie knew and who was familiar with her situation. He was accompanied by someone from the district attorney's office. It was through this interview that a bizarre, horrific, and unexpected story began to unravel. What happened here? I tried to kill myself. Why would you do that, sweetie? Tell me why. I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't know where else to go. I didn't know what else to do. And then like, one night I just got like really, really like angry and depressed. And I just, I don't know. I just felt like the whole world was kind of just like collapsing on me. And I just wanted to like to end it. This isn't the real reason they're talking to Cassie. And also not just because of what happened at the Ryder house. 
there's a far more chilling story lurking in the background of Cassie and Johnny's crime spree. I think you know why I'm here. I just need to understand why. Talk to me, please. What I can't do, I can't talk to you unless you be honest with me. I wasn't the one who intentionally thought about it, thought about doing that. Thought about doing what? Say it. Once you say it, it's out. Killing my grandparents. This admission was a horrible confirmation of what police already suspected. Tragically, Wendy and Randall's bodies were found inside their house when police forced entry. Based on their condition, it was estimated that they'd been dead for about a week by that time. In an exclusive interview with Iwu, Chris Bjorge, Wendy and Randall's son and Cassie's uncle, recalled hearing the terrible news for the first time when a family movie night was interrupted by a call from the police department. So, I get a call back. Probably about 10 or 15 minutes later, and I'm just like, Mr. Bjorg, I'm so sorry, but we found them. So what do you mean you found them? What does that mean? He said, we found them. They, um, they've both been killed. They, they've been murdered. I'm like, are you sure about that? He's like, yeah, there's, there's no question. You know, were they, were they perfect? Absolutely not. You know, but I, I loved my parents, you know, flaws and all. Um, but they, it's not what they deserved. Cassie's admission to the murders would turn out to be the least shocking detail of what she would tell investigators once she was transported to the police station for a more formal interview. There you go. You can have a seat right here. Okay. Pull you in a little bit. You guys the bathroom? Can you uh, grab the cutters? Yep. Yeah. Despite the seriousness of her circumstances, Cassie doesn't seem too worried while waiting for police to come back with a tool to remove the flexicuffs around her arms. Oh, let me get these things off, yeah. Okay. You are doing all right eating? Uh-huh. I was getting there. Mm-hmm. You get them? Yeah, I mean, these things are thick. Let me do it away from you yeah. so I don't, uh... <laughs> Stab me. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> just did already. <laughs> okay. You feel right. better? Yes. Thank you. With that handled, the investigators settle down to eat with Cassie. It's unusual that everyone is eating together and an out-of-the-box approach. Though likely a non-standard, it's a very interesting tactic to establishing rapport. It plays into the natural association to relax while eating and will likely be very effective. As the group eats, the investigators set about getting to know Cassie better. You in the sports, obviously, I guess, was told the karate stuff. Kung fu, yeah. What's up with that stuff? Mm. Is it kung fu? Is that what it's called? Well, I did this martial arts called Tang Sudo for six years, and that's South Korean. And then I grew out of that, and then I found... Shaolin um, Gong Fu, which is basically Kung Fu, but it's what they call it in Chinese. And so I started doing that, and I've been doing that for four or five years. Hmm. I actually heard you. You're pretty good at it? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'll go to tournaments. I <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll go to tournaments all the time. I'm, I mean, I went to China for a month last year. Wendy and Randall made the trip to China possible for Cassie. According to friends and family, they'd hoped that this trip, along with a subsequent visit to Disney World, would help Cassie get a fresh start after moving in with them. But even this generosity wasn't enough to protect them from her wrath. Did you go, uh, what's, did you graduate high school or? No. Actually, you're only. Still a junior. Okay. Technically. At Duluth? No. I do online. Now. Oh, online. Yeah. Okay. K 12 International. I stopped going to Duluth in. 2015 because okay. um, that was around the time where like all the stuff was happening with my parents and stuff mm -hmm. and I started getting scared going to school because my stepdad literally come on campus looking around the whole campus just to find me mm -hmm. like he was going in classrooms and stuff so mm -hmm. I had to get like a restraining order. Well I don't want you know kind of to make you upset or make you relive anything but I just got some follow-up questions I'd like to ask you. Do you remember uh, when you read your rights and all that? Yeah. Okay. 
She did you understand all them? Yeah. Okay. Cassie has read her rights, and then the police got down to business. They started things off easy by asking about Johnny, likely trying to get a feel for the relationship at the heart of such terrible violence. Did you guys, you, you and Johnny pretty tight? Did you have feelings for him, or just kind of a boyfriend type thing? Or? I have feelings. I yeah. still have feelings for him. Oh, gotcha. I still care about him. I guess I'm going to ask a corny question. Is it love or no? Yeah. yeah. This is what he told me. Um, after Tybee, we went to Atlanta, and we were on, like, this, I don't know, it was, like, this parking lot thing, and we got to see, like, the whole city. Mm-hmm. And he told me that when we were sitting up there, that, like, for a second, he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he told me that all he could see was just me and then purple around me. And he said, like, purple is, like, a sign of love. And he said, like, ever since then, like, it was, like, love at first sight or something. Is he okay? Yeah, he's fine. So is he he is, sends his, his regards and all that stuff, so. Is he, like, is he doing okay? Was he no, he's fine. Okay. Yeah, he's, he actually is better off than you, you know, they weren't, weren't that deep or anything, so he did. He didn't. Really? Mm-hmm. Man, I could have sworn he did worse than me because I remember when we were in the bathroom because he did it with me mm-hmm. too. He kept going and I kept telling him to stop. So. Yeah, his maybe this tougher skin. I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Hmm. Okay. At this point, it was time for the police to ask Cassie some harder questions. Regardless of her forthright demeanor, Police already knew from what they found in the house that Cassie was keeping some of her more callous actions to herself. They just had to get her to admit it. As she tells her story again in the interrogation room, there are key changes and omissions from the one she told while at the hospital, leaving the officers the task of piecing together the horrific truth. The plan was that we were both going to get both of our families, but first we got my grandparents then that's why we went over to Johnny's house and we attacked his sister and her boyfriend because we were, he wanted to kill his family. Okay. So that's like, we stayed in town for a couple days because, you know, we wanted to get some money. We wanted to get ready to leave. And then that plan, just going over to his house, kind of just like, it didn't work out at all. It, it just went, it went downhill from there. The plan had been to take out Johnny's family members one by one. But the plan was obliterated from the get-go because Mindy's boyfriend was present when they arrived. When Johnny's mother showed before Mindy and Kevin had been subdued, Johnny and Cassie abandoned the savage attempt. Clearly, the assault that had kicked off the investigation in the first place wasn't an assault at all, but rather attempted murder. That was Johnny's idea, because then that's why that's the reason why he asked me if I wanted to kill my grandparents. Because he wanted to already kill his family. And he was like, let's be Bonnie and Clyde. Despite Johnny's questionable aspirations, Cassie didn't say that any of this struck her as a bad idea. In fact, it seems likely that Cassie and Johnny were a dangerous mix of two antisocial personalities. They seemed to fuel each other's anger. Had they not joined forces, it's very possible that individually they wouldn't have been able to go through with the plan. But they were both willing to do the unthinkable together, becoming the ultimate toxic personality mix. So I guess let's uh, I guess let's start from scratch uh, about what happened, starting from when you ran away. I guess is that the thirty first? Do you remember twenty eighth or something like that? I don't really. Was it? I didn't really run away. My grandma, like, kicked me out. Okay. Because, like, this is what happened. Like, I was chill with Johnny and my other friend Sabrina, and mm-hmm. I came home because, you know, it was time for curfew because mm-hmm. I didn't want to violate my probation. So I came home, and my grandpa was asleep, and my grandma got really mad at me, and she was, like, saying, like, oh, you know, if you don't like it here, you know, we're just going to find somewhere else for you to stay. And she just said that out of the blue. Like, she just got really mad for some reason. And so I was just like, if you're going to find another place for me to stay, I'm just going to leave. I'm just going to find somewhere else to go. So. Cassie goes a little bit deeper with the answer she gave in the hospital. They kept bringing up stuff about my mom. And, you know, like, my grandma would keep saying, like, oh, you know, I could easily just send you back to your mom's house. Or, you know, all this and that. And it just, 
I don't know. It got to a point where I couldn't take it anymore. Despite Cassie claiming Wendy kicked her out, it sounds more like Wendy was expressing concern that Cassie was still struggling in her new situation. In fact, according to Chris Bjorge, the family had already agreed upon a solution. So I spoke to Cassie a couple times and, um, you know, I said, hey, kid, you know, I don't know if you remember you know, Uncle Chris or not. Um, you know, I held you a couple times when you were a baby. Um, what's going on? And she said, well, you know, I just I, I got to get out of here. Um, you know, there, there's just so many things that are going on. And I said, OK, well, how about you come in and, and live with us? Chris and Cassie seemed friendly and agreeable to moving in with him and his wife in Florida. However, he shared that Wendy and Randall did not mention just how dangerous her behavior and aggression towards them had become. As it turned out, Cassie never did make it to Florida, instead running off with Johnny. And this wasn't the first time Cassie had run away from her grandparents. Wendy reported Cassie missing once before when she disappeared with her ex-boyfriend Tyler and was gone for over a month. When Cassie took off again, this time with Johnny, her grandparents might have expected a similar scenario to play out, ending with Cassie's eventual return. For the next few days, it did. Cassie lived with Johnny in his car, and it wasn't until one particular conversation that the dominoes of disaster started to fall. So you, uh, so I guess when do you decide to go back to your grandparents' house uh, in the middle of the night? It was like a couple days after, like two or three days. Mm -hmm. You remember Saturday, Sunday? Do you have exact? I don't really remember. Like I, I didn't really even know like what day it was mm -hmm. that we went into the house. And before you did that, did you and Johnny meet up somewhere at we, a park or something yeah. to talk about we what was going on? We went to Peace Ridge Park and we talked about it. At first, it wasn't my idea at first. Mm -hmm. Um. How did he even get, I guess, what was said? How did he even bring up? What was the context? He first asked me, are you afraid to die? Mm -hmm. And I said, no. And then I asked him, are you afraid to die? And he said, no. And he, and he was just talking about how we could, like, run away together, you know, that kind of, like, dream. And he asked me, he was like, would you kill your grandparents? And I kind of, like, hesitated for a minute. And I was like, Why? And he was just like, I don't know, I mean, because he knows probably everything that I've been through with all of my family. And he understands that, you know, like, all I really wanted to do was just kind of get away from everything, kind of just move on with myself. Like, I wasn't having a good relationship with my grandparents. Like, it just, it started getting really bad, you know, like that I got a charge from them because, you know, like, I fought them, you know. I might have broken, like, my grandpa's ribs when, you know, for that charge for simple assault mm -hmm. and simple battery, you know. And it just, like, it just got really worse. Cassie uses the phrase, you know, a lot here, and it's a way for her to try to convince them that they should understand her actions. Was your mom ever part of the plan? Of killing them? Mm -hmm. I wanted to. Was it something you and Johnny discussed, or is it something no. you just thought of? Well, I mean, we did discuss it, but then Johnny was like, no, we can't waste our time on them. And I was like, okay. But I wanted to. Johnny kind of told you not to? Yeah. That it wouldn't be beneficial? Yeah, because, you know, I, I don't know what's really going on with my parents, you know, I mean... We drove over by their house the other day. They have new cars, you know. I don't know what guns they have in their house. You know, I don't really know what's going on inside their house. So, I mean, I don't know. You didn't know what you would be met with. Yeah, I didn't. Whereas your grandparents, you knew it was kind of a safe bet. With the victims chosen, all that remained was for Cassie and Johnny to iron out the details of their evil plan. But how we started talking about it was... Like, we started out, like, with, you know, what time should we go to the house? How are we going to do this? You know, like, what, are we, what you know, materials do we need to, you know, do this? So, you know, we started talking about that. And then, you know, so we decided to go around, like, midnight or 1, 1.30. Because mm -hmm. my grandma normally went to sleep around, like, 11, 30, 12. So we would 
we decided like, you know, we would park down the road and then the park was literally like right behind my backyard. And so I unlocked the back door. I was able to open the back door a little bit and not have the stuff in front of the door fall and make a noise. So I was able to like maneuver in and then I moved the stuff in front of the door and then I got Johnny in and then we closed the door and locked it. And then would you guys kind of just hang out downstairs or just start moving upstairs? We, we went upstairs. We didn't immediately go upstairs. Like, we went to the stairs and then we were, like, just listening, just hearing what was going on. And we thought everything was good. And then we went upstairs and... Oh, did you guys have anything in your hands or you just... Yeah, I had a... Um, what's it called? It's one of those car tools. Is it to do a tire or yeah, is it tire to fix iron. it? It okay. was a tire iron. So I had one of those. Where'd you get that at? Johnny's car. Okay. He had one in his car. His Honda mm -hmm. or whatever. And Johnny just used his fist. And he brought a black book bag that had duct tape in it. And it had the tire iron in it. And it had gloves in it. Because we were also wearing gloves too. It seems like Cassie was taking orders from Johnny. Suggesting that unlike his idol Clyde, he was the mastermind while Cassie provided the means to get in the home. Johnny likely knew how Cassie felt about her family situation and her dysfunctional home environment, so he offered her a way out, a plan that may have sounded to Cassie like a solution to her suffering. So who's first up the stairs? Is it you and he's kind of following you? Or? Yeah, okay. I go up the stairs. He goes into my grandpa's room and then I go into my grandma's room. Mm -hmm. Do you hear kind of what's going on over there? Yeah. And does that kind of cue you off to mm -hmm. with your grandmother there? Yeah, he's, he started going at it. And then, you know, I could hear my grandpa just yelling, you know, them fighting. And then I started getting the rush. And then, you know, like, that's when I started hitting my grandma in mm -hmm. the head. So you took the tire iron? Is it just... I started just... Just beating her head with it. Based on Cassie's manner of speaking, she sounds like a typical teenager. But at the same time, she's completely emotionally detached from the incident and from her horrific actions, which some may point out as being psychopathic. As for the crime scene itself, there was no denying that the attack on Wendy was brutal. Chris Bjorge once again offered some insight into what the aftermath of the attack was like. When I first went to Georgia, the first place that we stopped was the funeral home where they were. The funeral home workers said, there's no way that we're going to let you see them. It's just way, way too bad. Wendy and Randall were cremated as the state of their bodies was simply too poor for restoration. Chris went on to talk about how sad it is that his parents only ever got to meet one of his children and that his kids were robbed of the opportunity to have their grandparents. For now, Chris still keeps Wendy and Randall's ashes and says he may one day scatter them when he feels ready. Back with Cassie, the police continued gathering details. Was yeah. that the first hit? Yeah. The back of the head? Yeah. That's where I mainly hit her in the head. She huh? bit me. I think I took a picture of that yesterday, right? She, yeah, she bit yeah. me in my finger too, but I forgot which finger. It was on my right hand. I think it was either like my middle finger or it was that one. And when you guys, when you and your grandmother used to get into it, is that, that's kind of how she, did she bite you before yeah. to kind of get you off her or whatnot? Yeah, she's okay. bitten me before. So when do you meet back up with Johnny? Do you, do you leave your grandmother there or kind of what happens? So I started hitting my grandma and I already had duct tape and then, you know, Johnny's doing his thing. Mm. And, you know, I stopped hearing Johnny doing whatever. So he comes in the room with me and my grandma and, you know, he helps me like tie up my grandma with the duct tape. How did you do that? Is it just her hands or? I got her hands, I got her whole head, and then I got her ankles. Okay, with well her hands? I guess just I'm behind her back. Just like, just like this? Yeah. Okay. What about anything on her head or neck or did you? Yeah, we kind of like wrapped the duct tape around her head-ish, and then that was it. What was that for? Just? Just so then it kept, she kept it on. Oh, okay. I just kind of. And you said her ankles too? Mm-hmm. Okay. And Johnny helped you tie her up? Yeah, I mean, I mostly did, but I needed, like, a little bit of help because, you know, she was, like, you know, moving around and stuff. And so he helped me a little bit, and then he went back into my grandpa's room. It shows a profound lack of empathy that Cassie was able to continue on with the act, despite her grandmother still being alive. At the hospital, Cassie had shared some additional disturbing details about the attack. What did Johnny do to your grandpa? He beat him. With his fists? Police found bloody handprints on the wall above the bed and footprints on the sheets, 
suggesting that when Johnny decided his fists weren't strong enough, he resorted to stomping on Randall. What else? He got a knife, a big kitchen knife. He stabbed him and slit his throat. Captain made him bleed out in front of my grandma because we dragged my grandma into the room because my grandma was sleeping in the other room. Well, she had duct tape behind her back. Yeah, he duct taped her too. Yeah, so Johnny started beating my grandpa and I started beating my grandma. I could, I could just hear like the blood, you know, just gushing and just I could just hear my grandpa in pain. And then I was fighting with my grandma. Like I wasn't saying she didn't know it was us because we were masked up, you know, we were you masks on. Yeah, like, well, not masks technically. They were just kind of like t-shirts and just, you know, tied around. So, you know, it was sort of like a mask. Your grandmother never said your name. No, she didn't know it was us. You swear that to me? She didn't know. I swear. She didn't know it was us. She had no idea. A short time later, however, Cassie slips up and admits that she and Johnny spoke during the attack. Therefore, there's little doubt that Wendy and Randall knew exactly who caused their suffering. Just a few moments later, she makes another serious mistake. He picked out which knife he wanted. Which one? It was the sharpest one. It was like the biggest one. And then he started using it on my grandpa. And then he slit his throat. Pause there. We. Hmm. You said we started using it on my grandpa. Oh, him. Sorry, it was him. I didn't. I didn't touch my grandpa. I didn't. I didn't do. I didn't use the knife on my grandpa. That was all Johnny. I couldn't. I couldn't have done that. So he was the one who did it. Back in the interrogation room, it seems that Cassie has ironed out more of the details of her story, with some noticeable changes. She doesn't mention masks, and she doesn't mention not talking. What were you doing when you went back in your grandpa's room? I was still with my grandma, and then... In her room? Yeah, and then I dragged her into my grandpa's room, and, and Johnny asked me to go get some knives. So I got some knives from downstairs in the kitchen, and I got three like, big butcher knives. And then that's when he started, like, stabbing my grandpa. Because then I went back upstairs because I dragged my grandma into my grandpa's room. So they were both in there. Mm -hmm. And then I asked her for the code to her safe. Because I already knew that she had a safe in her closet. I just didn't know it was in the safe. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... Did she tell you? Yeah, I mean, like, she kept saying, like, I'll give you money. I'll give you my keys. You know, I'll give you anything you want. But, um, yeah, she, she just kept... Was she able to talk with the duct tape around her face? Yeah. Like, she was, she was, like, mumbling. You could still understand her, but, like, at the same time, you couldn't. Cassie basically described how her grandmother pleaded for her life. This sort of scenario could elicit emotion from even the most psychopathic of murderers, particularly since it was coming from the psychopath's own grandmother. Still, Cassie continued on with the act... When Johnny's stabbing your grandfather, is it mainly in the torso or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, he just, I don't know why he did that, but he just kept going. Like, How many times? More than two, more yeah, five? More than five. Okay. It was more than five. While she was still in the hospital, Cassie revealed yet another twisted element to the attack, having to do with why she dragged Wendy into her grandfather's room. Why did you drag her in there? Why would you do that? Make me understand that. Why would you drag her Did she not give you the code? Is that why you did it? No. When did she give you the code? At what point did she give you the code? She gave me the code after I dragged her into the room. So you did it so that she would tell you, know that you were serious? Yeah. Forcing Wendy to watch her husband's brutal murder is torturous. But even with that, there was more to Cassie's confession that came out at the police station. So she told us the code and, you know, I went in the closet because that's where they kept the safe. So, you know, I go in there, you know, I'm checking out all the stuff and I grab the book bag and I just start stuffing the book bag with everything, you know. Like there was envelopes just filled with money. There was probably about like a thousand dollars that we found in that safe that they were just saving. And did you know about that money or you just said no? Well, my grandma, it was kind of weird. Like, she was kind of giving me, like, an idea about it before. Like, she was saying, what if I just gave you $1,000? Would that just make the world a better place? I'm just like, no, I don't want $1,000, you know? So, you know, she kept saying that. And then, like, when I saw it, I was just like, wow, she actually had $1,000 on her safe. Like, that's crazy. Cassie's tone here is an indication of her immaturity as she likely doesn't realize that $1,000 won't get her and Johnny very far if they're planning to run away. 
especially once Cassie reveals they failed to manage their funds. You got $1,000 in cash. Did you spend it all or do you yeah. have it all? We spent it all. Okay. On food, money, weed. And the money you were going to potentially get from Johnny's family was going to be yeah. what you were going to start new with? Yeah. Where, where were you going to go afterwards? We were going to go like, to Florida. Okay. And where in particular? Maybe like Pensacola, Panama City, just somewhere, you know, where we could just like escape. Pensacola was only a few hundred miles away and doesn't seem like a very far way to run after a crime so heinous. Apparently, though, the aspirational Bonnie and Clyde thought the distance would be sufficient. You may remember that Chris Bjorge, whom Cassie was supposed to go live with, also lived in Florida. Police questioned if he was next on the couple's hit list, but it didn't appear that they had any plans to target him or even visit his area. So you guys put that stuff in a bag and then basically Johnny's in, a, in your grandpa's room mm -hmm. with your grandpa and your grandma in the room. Mm -hmm. Do you come back in there and say, hey, I, I got the stuff or mm -hmm. what? Okay. Yeah, I go back into the room and I tell him that I got the stuff. And after that, he um, slits my grandpa's throat. And then we dragged my grandma into the bathroom. <clears throat> what was the reason for that? Just to bring her to the bathroom? Yeah, I don't know why we brought her back into the bathroom. I guess we didn't want to bring her into the bedroom. Okay. So we just brought her into the bathroom. And then Johnny slit her throat too. Mm -hmm. And I actually hit her in the back of the head with the tire iron. Well, not the back of the head, but like right where your spine is. Because he was telling me, he was like, if you hit right there, like just one like good hit, you can just knock the person out and then they'll be dead. Mm -hmm. And she was like pretending to be dead for a while. Like I would, you know, check up on her and I would see that she was still breathing. And I'll be like, Johnny, she's still alive. What the heck? And then like Johnny finally like... Like, made the, like, last blow, and she, it was, was kind of creepy because she was, like, scared uh -huh. to Dally. This is a particularly shocking statement because what exactly did Cassie expect? Her grandmother not to be scared in her last moments as she's being brutally attacked. Once again, Cassie's emotional hospital interview revealed something intriguing. He, he was the one who, like, ended it for both of them because I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't. He kept, like, he, like, like, he had knives, too. Like, he slipped both of their, you know, like, necks. And I couldn't do it, so he did it, because I couldn't. She was staying strong for a while, you know? Like, she was pretending to be dead, but we could see that she was still breathing. And she did that for a while, and then Johnny, like, knocked her out in the back, like, a pressure point, like, right where your spine is. So you said the last blow, though, was, was just, like, the last hit, like, the last hit with the tire iron? Mm -hmm. And who did that? You were Johnny. Johnny. H had her throat already been slit? And, and then after he, like, did that, then he slit her throat. Wendy's body was retrieved from the bathroom, along with one of the knives, pieces of duct tape used to restrain her, and a pair of scissors. Tragically, Wendy's final Facebook post was made on the same day that she was murdered by the very girl she was trying to protect. But perhaps the most sorrowful detail came from Chris's recollection of the Bjorge house after the crime. They loved Cassie. They adored her. When we got to the house after all this happened, the house was still back. There was the smell of decay, the smell of weed. It, it was just, it was awful going there. And everywhere you looked, there was pictures of Cassie. They absolutely loved her. The investigators, however, had to keep digging into Cassie's increasingly horrific tale. Kind of walk me through what was going in, on in your head. I mean, was it, like you said, the rush where it's go time, I just need to do what the fuck we came here to do? Yeah. Or was it like, fuck them, they gave me curfew, they deserved it, it was let's like, get this shit going? It's both, both, honestly. Like, I mean, I stopped doing kung fu for a while just because, you know, my mind wasn't there, you know? Mm -hmm. I All of my feelings were and my emotions were all over the place and I wasn't able to focus. So that really affected, you know, my Kung Fu. But when I was there, you know, like, I don't know, like just all of my emotions kind of just like came out when it was happening. Like I was just angry and I was sad, but I was heartbroken at the same time, you know, cause it was just like, 
you know, why did all of this stuff have to, you know, happen with my family, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, why did I have to deal with all this bullshit, you know? And I, I just kind of really got tired of it, and I couldn't handle it anymore. Like, I just kept exploding inside almost. Mm-hmm. Like, I wanted to just run away and just be by myself with someone, you know, and just start my life. Like, I, I was just tired of being... And like, Grandma and Grandpa were your bigger turtles. Yeah. Is that how you saw them as your biggest hurdles to being with Johnny? No. They were my biggest hurdles because of probation. Okay. If I didn't get probation, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in this, I don't know, like, probation kind of really messed me up because, you know, I was going to get a job, you know, I was going to, like, start getting money, just, you know, starting my life, and then once I got probation, it kind of just, like, really messed up everything, you know? As Cassie attempted to explain her motive, things started to make less sense. It's hard to imagine a double homicide leading to the start of a good life. Additionally, Cassie mentioned several times that she wanted to get away from her family, but never explains why she needed to murder them in order to accomplish this. She could have easily disappeared with Johnny to another city or state. What was likely stopping her was money, or lack thereof. She makes it sound like her grandparents were a barrier, stopping her from getting away once and for all, but really it seems that Cassie needed to kill them in order to get the cash she suspected they had in the safe. Obviously when you guys were done with everything, you had had some blood on you, I bet. Yeah, I had some blood on my face. Okay. Did you change clothes? Yes. Were you in the house when you changed your clothes? Yes. You had extra clothes because you lived there. Yeah. And what about Johnny? Did Johnny have to change clothes? Yes. Or what did you guys do with those clothes? We put them in a trash bag, and I think we left the trash bag in my grandpa's car. Okay. With the knives that okay. he used. It was all in, like, one trash bag. I mean, then did you guys pretty much just leave the upstairs, or...? Yeah, well, like, after that, then we closed the doors, and then we were just checking around, seeing if everything was okay, and then I started grabbing my clothes and start stuffing bags with my clothes, and then Johnny's, you know, walking around, doing his thing, checking to make sure that they were both dead, and checking to make sure if we uh, didn't forget anything. Then we left, and then we came back to the house when you guys left where'd you guys go to we went over to like kroger or Publix to go get something to eat and then we went back to the house so we just kind of like chilled there that's right they chilled there with the bodies of her grandparents nearby while they ate typically if a person can eat after committing such a horrific act it's an indication of a lack of remorse and a total emotional disconnect from the victims Something Cassie didn't mention was that they abandoned Johnny's car outside the grocery store they visited and switched to driving Randall's car. But she's still withholding a few despicable secrets. When you guys were, I guess, together for the two, three, however many days mm-hmm. uh, at the house, when you guys left, did you go to any, make any purchases to buy some new clothes, using credit cards or anything? Yeah. We got receipts in that. So do you remember whose credit card you used? It was my grandma's credit card. In reality, Cassie and Johnny were in the house with the bodies for a week. What about men? They carry wallets. Do you take grandpa's wallet? I couldn't find his wallet, so I had no idea where his wallet was. So I just had my grandma's wallet in her purse. He hid it underneath his bed. He found his wallet. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, Smart guy, because we almost didn't find it. His either. wallet and his cell phone were under his bed. Really? Yeah. I guess that's where he started hiding it. It's eerie how this makes Cassie laugh. Her jovial reaction and laughter are indications that this was all a game, like someone solved a riddle for her and she found it amusing. Cassie also admitted that she first took Wendy's phone during the attack to prevent her from calling for help. She also confessed to impersonating Wendy when concerned family members reached out. Now, when family from California was trying to contact your grandma, tell me about that. I took her phone. And? I told him that everything was okay. You did? You sent the message? Yeah, I was texting her. There was other people too. Well, what do you mean other people? Other, other, other friends other of theirs friends. trying to reach out? Yeah. You texted all those people also? No, I just texted Sylvia. What did you text? Everything's okay. Don't worry. I'm fine. And then they started freaking out. Like, there was this lady named like, Denise. 
and a couple other people that I didn't even, I don't know. They are like my grandma's friends and they were just like, hey, I hope you're okay, blah, blah, blah. I didn't even open the text. Like I just sort of read them and then just ignored them. Elise had acquired some other shocking evidence and it was time for them to reveal what they knew. Did you guys ever chill with anyone during that week at all? Or no? Yeah. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, I chilled. We chilled with some of his friends, some of my friends, and kind of a mixture of both of our friends. Because yeah. we sort of had, like, the same friends-ish. Like, yeah, we were just chilling with them. You know, we would just go meet up with them. We would never have anyone come over to the house. Mm-hmm. We were just like, that's, that's a no. That's a big no-no. This is a lie, and the truth, when revealed, is even more horrific than you can imagine. The investigators would revisit the question of Cassie's interactions with her friends that week. For the time being, they learned that Cassie even went to her martial arts class just like normal that week and slept in the TV room downstairs to stay away from the decaying bodies of her grandparents. Did you do anything to the doors? or Johnny did. He glued the doors. Okay. He went in the gr- my garage and found the... What's it called? The... I don't know. Talk. Yeah. So, yeah, he did that. The point of that is what? Just He just did that. He just decided to do that. He didn't tell me. I just watched him and I was just like, okay. Once again, Cassie isn't telling the full truth here, holding back the disturbing reason why Johnny caught the doors closed. Investigators will push her for that final damning information soon enough. Was there, like, ever a snapping point or, I mean, do you feel bad about what happened? Do you think she deserves what happened or what, you know, how are you feeling right now? I'm, I'm not in your shoes, With you know? my grandparents? Yeah. I mean, I feel terrible. I mean, I feel like the worst person on the planet. But at the same time, it was kind of just like, I don't know. I mean, I feel heartbroken. But I don't know. It's really weird. Like, I'm just, I'm really sad about it because, you know, like, there was so much stuff going on between me and my grandparents already. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it anymore, you know, like. um, Like you said with his follow-up question, though, I mean, did they deserve it? Did grandma deserve it? Did grandpa deserve it? Or was it kind of just more getting away from your own family? It was more kind of just getting away. You don't think that grandma did anything? I mean, I was pretty pissed at her for, you know, the couple times that, you know, like, she would call the cops on me for, you know, no reason sometimes. Or, like, a lot of the stuff that she would say would be really offensive because it would be about my mom. As you remember, Cassie wanted to include her mother in the string of murders she and Johnny planned to commit, so it doesn't really track that she would be so offended by her grandmother's remarks. Regardless, Cassie clearly demonstrates that she had some built-up anger toward her grandmother, but it's still unclear what she thought her grandfather did to be subjected to such an awful murder. Who did you have a more contentious relationship with? Who was the one you were butting heads with all the time? My grandma. Your grandma more so than your grandpa? Yeah, I couldn't talk to my grandpa. I, like, I I did not have a real good relationship with him. Like, I've, you know, before we did, but then I don't know, like I wasn't able to talk to him. A person who was truly traumatized by the event would struggle to verbalize or even think about the story. The memories of what occurred would be far too painful to cope with for any typical individual. Cassie speaks very matter-of-factly, as if killing her grandparents was the same as committing any other minor violation of the law. Despite recalling her horrific actions, Cassie remains unruffled while the officers take a quick break. (sighs) But her attitude is finally about to change. Instead of questioning her story further, the investigators decided to confront Cassie with evidence of exactly what she'd been trying to hide from them. Hey, do me a favor. You gotta take a look at that. That's you and him, right? Is that at your grandparents' house? It sure looks like the living room of your grandparents' house. How would that be possible? Who's taking that? I have, that couldn't be at my grandparents' house. There was no one at my grandparents' house, so that could have been at my grandparents' house. Well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't shit this out. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Who, you know what I'm saying? Well, let me watch it again. I gotta. That must have been before. 
This is the video police just showed Cassie, which seemed to elicit her first emotional reaction in her second interrogation so far. The question is why? People have to say about you, like, you know, I don't listen to people, like, I love you. You kick ass. Who's over there? That might have been like... But your grandparents don't like Johnny, so why won't we see at your house much? Like, he didn't go to my house at all. Like, I mean, that could have been not, that could have been at my house. I had to be in someone else's house because we had no one at my house. It was just me and Johnny. I mean, you've been honest with me. I just, I saw that, and it, obviously I've been at your grandparents' house. You know what your grandparents' house looks like. And just even the stuff said almost seems after the fact, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Johnny wasn't allowed at the house at all, as Wendy and Randall considered him a bad influence on Cassie. Rightfully so. While it was possible that Johnny had snuck inside for a visit, the investigators suspected a far more sinister explanation. Cassie is left alone for just a few moments before the investigators return to drop another bomb. Hey Cassie, who's Sunshine? Sunshine? Uh -huh. She's one of my friends. Was she at your grandparents' house? She's been there before. Was she there during when you guys were hanging out there? You sure? Or? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I don't remember having anyone over at my house. Just as Cassie had been holding back key parts of the story, the investigators hadn't told her outright that they already know what she's been trying to hide, or that they'd already been in touch with some of her friends, including Sunshine who was able to confirm the final shocking piece of the puzzle. Did she ever hang out with Cassie at her grandparents' house? Yes. You probably already know where I'm getting with this. Yes, I was inside the house while they were dead. Okay. I didn't know that they were dead. No. I... Yeah, that's, that's understandable. Just, I guess let's back up then. When, because uh, that's the main thing, I, obviously, I'm curious. I don't about. know when exactly it was, but they had been inside the, the house for a while because you could smell it once you walked inside the house. Now you're saying it smells like shit. What did it I mean, didn't think anything of it because... Did you ever ask him, like, why does it... I did, and Johnny said that it was just because he hadn't flushed the toilet. The police left Cassie alone for a short time again, and this time she appeared to show some real emotion. It was short-lived, however, as the police soon return, armed with Sunshine's story to confront Cassie again. <laughs> We got a problem, man. I mean, as you know, I, I'm a cool dude. So is she, okay? I've been doing this longer than you've been alive, okay? I'm a no-bullshitter. I don't know what those DA investigators, I don't know what type of, you know, how many times they talk to you or that. Uh, we're different in that aspect, okay? I'm cool as shit with you if you're cool as shit with me. But once lying and stuff like that starts, I have a problem. I believe that there were people at that house, okay? <laughs> It was. It was probably only sunshine. I, I mean, I just want no if or anything left like that. Unfortunately, you're in this, okay? There's no saving face right now. So a lot of this was on the news, okay, as you can imagine. So he's been getting phone calls about you inviting people over to your house. So who was there? The only person who I can think of would be there would be Sunshine and her boyfriend. While it might be true that they were the only visitors, Multiple friends and acquaintances of Cassie told police that they'd received invitations to the house that week. They all turned her down for various reasons. If Cassie had it her way, there would have been far more visitors. So for all these people to be inside your house, we're going to both have to assume that it was after you guys killed your grandparents. I'll be straight up, dude. We heard about a conversation that took place inside there where someone was bitching about the smell. And Johnny's like, no, nah, dude, it's just sewage. There's a sewage problem upstairs. Is this not... That never came up. Now, that could be rumors. You know how when kids talk, rumors... That never was a conversation that came up. The mm -hmm. only only people who came over to the house was Sunshine. So they did come over to the house after you killed your grandparents? Yeah, I mean, all of it was like one big rush. You know, I don't remember what day they came over. But I'm not asking for a day. I'm just asking for in seven days after you guys killed your grandparents and before you went to go attack Johnny's family. Yeah. Sunshine and Alex were at your house. Yes. Cassie's story was changing consistently. As if what Cassie had shared already isn't shocking enough, officers also found recordings of Cassie and Johnny being intimate, filmed inside the house after her grandparents were killed. Finally, the last of Cassie's cruelty was about to be revealed. 
Johnny, you said glues and what we know to be cock, cocks the doors. Was that immediately after or was that before people came over? It was before people came over. Okay, so. I, I even poured bleach on them at, before he you did poured that bleach to the on Grandma and Grandpa? Yeah. And you left one of the bleach bottles in the bathroom next to Grandma? Yeah. Why did you pour bleach on them? Johnny told me to. For the smell? When did you pour the bleach on them? It was like a couple days after. Like, it was like before we left the house to go chill with some friends. Like, we did it before anyone came over to the house. With that, the awful truth is at last exposed. Before taking Cassie for fingerprints and photographs, the investigators leave her with some parting thoughts. Okay, let me ask you this then. You literally have showed no emotion towards your grandparents, and I don't have a problem. Like, I don't know the life that you were having, and I guess I can kind of understand that you wanted to sever that part of your life and start over again, okay? But why are you showing emotion with when I brought up Sunshine? What the hell is this chick? You know what I'm saying? She's just a close friend. She was there most of the time when I was going through the stuff with my parents. Anything else? It only seems that you're sorry you got caught that you had people over after. You don't seem to be sorry that you killed your grandparents. I am. I'm, I'm just letting you know. I'm just letting you know. Not that you need anything. Cassie was able to remain mostly void of any extreme emotions for nearly two hours as she talked with the investigators. However, now the consequences of what she did may be sinking in. Her distress didn't last long, though. Her behavior just a short while later indicates exactly how seriously she takes her actions. By the time the case came to court, the wannabe outlaw couple were not as close as they once were. Johnny and Cassie reportedly broke up, and each blamed the other for the crime. Eventually, they both pled guilty to charges of murder, aggravated assault, and theft. They were both given two life sentences plus 21 years, and will be eligible for parole after 60 years. Before being escorted from the courtroom, Johnny read a prepared statement apologizing for his actions. His former friend Jake speculated that if he hadn't met Cassie, he wouldn't have gone down such a dark path in life. Despite the horror of his parents' deaths, Chris chooses to live life as a survivor rather than a victim, and prefers to focus on the joy he finds in memories of his parents rather than the tragedy of their death. My mom, she was very proud of the fact that she was short and ornery, but her, her mouth made up for her height, you know, and that's not bad mouth in her. That's something that she said all the time. She was a wisecracker. She was fun to be around. So I try to honor them every day with what it is that we do. 